All right, let me show you here some proof that uh, this uh, Rabbi Zacharias here, Dr. Rabbi Zacharias, um, he actually uh, says about the Trinity being of, you know, coming from philosophy. He's at some big event here, 16th of February, 2005. Let's listen to this. The guy gets into all this philosophical just nonsense. Listen to this. My question is about the law of non-contradiction. Uh, my problem is that I like the law of non-contradiction and I don't like the law of non-contradiction. Um, <laughs> uh, with Christianity, I think that we run the possibility of showing favoritism, at least in the presentation that I feel like I heard, because the problem with Hinduism is that in its core, it violates the law of non-contradiction. Uh, for Christianity, what is more in the core of Christianity than its doctrine of God? And in our doctrine of God, what is more in the core of our doctrine of God than the Trinity, that God is both one and three? And I wonder if I'm showing favoritism in accepting violations of the law of no contradiction. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, another mind destroyed by uh, the whole uh, college, Christian college education type of a thing. I mean, just philosophical nonsense, the law of contradiction, blah, 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 all this, just quote scripture, you know, believe what the book says, but, you know, brings up the point, how can God be three separate persons and yet just one God? Absolutely, can't. Uh, that is a stupid, ridiculous contradiction of common sense, all right, God is not three different persons, but one God. Uh, if that was the case, then each one of the three separate persons couldn't claim the title of God holy by themselves. They'd have to be in the presence of the other two to be the one God. It's absolutely absurd. But now listen to how philosophical he gets here. And he actually goes into the thing of divine essence. And he actually talks about this comes from philosophy, the Trinity. Watch this. Fair enough. I think obviously if you... Um if you are looking at that which is systemically contradictory and then the doctrines of each faith you raise you raise a legitimate question the doctrine of the trinity which it talks about uh... you know one uh, one being and yet three persons in the godhead so let me try and illustrate this as best as i can because this i think is uh, that this touches the nerve of the heart and the heart of what the christian faith is all about <laughs> what the Catholic faith is all about, okay? Doesn't quote scripture. Doesn't say, get your Bible out, turn in your Bible to, doesn't quote scripture. He gets, uh, let me let me illustrate this with philosophical meandering. That's what he's going to do. Watch. C.S. Lewis, in one of his books. C.S. Lewis quotes C.S. Lewis, the guy that was a Satanist, member of the Order of the Golden Dawn, if I remember correctly. The guy was a, an occultist, blended occultism, with Christianity. C.S. Lewis was a lost man. He's burning in hell. And I'm glad he's burning in hell. He was a very wicked man, deceived a lot of people. His Chronicles of Narnia were just just so disgusting and satanic. Just ugh, bad. You know, le the children are led around by Mr. Tumas, the satyr. You know, half man, half goat. Uh, you read the description of it. He's, you know, of Mr. Tumas's description. He's describing popular depictions of Satan, and then Aslan is a lion. You say, well, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, but there's also the lion that you know, goes about seeking whom he, whom he may devour, Satan, in other words. C.S. Lewis was on the callist, you know, dealing with the witches and everything else in the story. But let's continue. Talks precisely about this analogical uh, uh, comparison between God and human beings. And he says, if you take a dimension in life and add a second dimension to it, then a third dimension to it, he said, with each added dimension, you have greater capacity and greater, uh, greater possibilities of, of uh, that which can be actualized. If you take one dimension, you get a straight line. You take two dimensions, you get a figure. You take a third dimension, you can get objects. And he said, when you break these dimension, uh, dimensions down, the fundamental components remain the same, but the accretion of those components give you greater possibilities. So when you've got a finite being, 
and a, and a, and a contingent being and a limited being but you've got one dimension in which you're describing the very nature of being you add to that now the possibility of an infinite being an uncaused being and uh, and 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 a being that is non-dependent you get the possibility of a, of an of a, of a being with greater complexity and the illustration i like to give to you is this it is not even so much that you start from the end nature of God and come down here. You start from where we are to understand what this might be. Fishermen knew there was a difference between one and three. Paul the rabbi knew there was a difference between one and three. Look, Paul the rabbi? I thought that Jesus said that you're not to call any man a rabbi. For one is your rabbi. Paul never used the title rabbi. Yeah. But why bother going to the scriptures? We, we're really impressed by this guy's intellect and oh, the big words and oh, oh it's so fancy something, the dimensions and the, and the, you know. How do people listen to this stuff? It just boggles my mind. Lost people listening to the lost man, I understand, but let's continue. The physician knew there was a difference between one and three. These are not kind of airheads floating around trying to posit a new kind of a concept to just pre to, to give a mathematical incongruity here. What they are talking about is that in the complexity of the very being of God, there is an I-U relationship within the Godhead. Now, to go from where we are to where God is, I think it is critical we, we follow this kind of reasoning here. It is this, the greatest search for philosophy of all time. Philosophy. Hmm. Little verse of scripture here real quick for you. The greatest search of, for philosophy of all time. You know, it's because philosophy is all we have right now. We don't have the Bible, so you know. I we'll have to just go with the philosophy here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the, of the world, and not after Christ. Not after Christ. They'll get you messed up through philosophy and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Body, soul, spirit, one being. So simple. So extremely simple, but you have to make it difficult with philosophy. Continue. Has been the search for unity and diversity. The greatest search has been for unity and diversity. The early Greek philosophers were looking at it, and then out comes somebody with four unities, earth, air, water, and fire. So his student comes on the scene and says, wait a minute, those are four, not one. So we coined the word quintessence. What is the fifth essence that unites these four essences? The word university, to find unity in diversity. On every American coin, e pluribus unum. Out of the multiplicity, you find one. Now, how do we explain... How do we explain the... Uh, yeah. I'm going to tie in there, I'm sure. In unity and diversity in the effect, which is what this world is. You and I are part of the effect. We've got unity and diversity in the effect of this universe. The only way to explain unity and diversity in the effect is if you've got unity and diversity in the first cause, and only in the Trinity is there unity and diversity in the community of the Trinity. <laughs> in other words, I have no idea what the Bible teaches. I'm not saved. The Holy Spirit isn't guiding me. All I have is a bunch of philosophical junk and garbage to just keep throwing at you and just vomiting out, you know, things. And, and hopefully it's kind of like a smoke screen, you know. I can just keep putting smoke out and hopefully the people won't understand that I'm actually an idiot, you know. Let's continue with a little bit more of this. This, this, this stuff is funny, okay. This is, you know, some people like stand-up comedians and things. I, I like this stand-up comedian. If you do not grant that, you actually have even a bigger problem to deal with. For example, in the Islamic concept of God, which is a monadic concept of Allah, and therefore is repeatedly throw against the Christian this attitude that we've got a plurality of gods, we've got a plurality of gods, that is not so. The Lord your God is one. 
in the complexity of the Trinity, there is an I, you, and a relationship in the Godhead himself. If you've got a monadic concept of God apart from the Trinity, then you end up with another philosophical problem. If God ever says he loves, who was he loving before the creation? If God says he speaks, who was he speaking to before the creation? So communication and affection or love is contained in the Godhead right from the beginning. Where God speaks in the community of the Trinity, where God loves in the Christian faith only does love precede life. In every other faith, life precedes love. So we end up defining love on our terms. There is no referent against it. But if you see the love expressed within the concept of the Trinity, and God's, Jesus' prayer was that you and I may be one, even as he and the Father are one. All I will say to you is Mortimer Adler, the great Jewish philosopher who was a late... Okay, going back to philosophers, I was just getting so deep here. How could there be love there in the, in before the creation if there's only one God? Um, because there's three parts to one God. Come out to Christ said, there will have to be majesty and mystery in God himself. And he says, to me, the mystery of the Trinity is a revelation of how God is complete in himself, in one being, the three persons as they relate in love and in language. No sophisticated mathematician need to tell the four writers of the Gospels that one and three are not the same. And yet they were hard and purposeful in the reflection of what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about. They weren't anything of the kind. Again, he keeps doing the satanic salute thing. What in the world? But, you know, they weren't anything of the kind. The, the three persons is not even in Scripture. It's just standing there lying to the people. A lying devil. If you look at your heart, and I look at mine, you know, my daughters, uh, uh, I mentioned yesterday, are in Indonesia. They just left Indonesia last night and uh, flew into Thailand. They are part of the tsunami relief, my two daughters, in their 20s. This morning as I spoke to her arriving in Chiang Mai in Thailand, she said, Dad, never in my life have I seen what I have just seen coming from Aceh. I've never seen anything like this. Bodies are still floating on shore members and parts of limbs are coming on shore and you know here they were for nearly 48 hours they couldn't eat or drink anything no bathrooms or anything of the kind what is it that drives humanity to go and reach out to these so stranded and so hurting i think it's the love of our fellow human beings that we are willing to go and do that if love is the heart of existence and god is love it is within the trinity itself that we hunger for relationships you hunger for relationship Within the Trinity itself, we hunger for relationships. Okay. I hunger for relationship. Existentially, I believe it is revealed in the Holy Trinity. Existentially, I believe. I mean, it's philosophical witchcraft nonsense. Himself, where the Father loves the Son, and the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. Is it one and three? No. I believe it's one in one sense, three in another. It's not a mathematical issue. It's the very nature of being. Unity, diversity in the community of the Trinity. There's both majesty and mystery. And I believe when we see God face to face, we'll find out why it is he made us thus to hunger for relationships ourselves. <laughs> I mean, what a bunch of junk. My word, not one verse of scripture quoted. And all through, it's philosophy. It's just the philosophers and the philosophy and things. Yeah. Well, I've showed this in other studies, but I'll show it one more time. Here you have uh, right here number 251 in the Roman Catholic Catechism. Okay. In order to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the church had to develop its own terminology with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin. All right. It goes right into it right there. Talks about essence and things over here. Um, you know, it just. This is Roman Catholicism, essence or nature, right there. Divine, divine substance, essence or nature, right there. Okay, let me show if I can zoom in on this thing here real quick. 251, right there. 
philosophical origin. So another uh, philosopher, not a saved man. So I just it's indefensible, this whole Trinity thing. You cannot defend it from the scriptures. You have to add to the scriptures and borrow from philosophy. So that's why a Bible-believing Christian that's saved and has the Holy Spirit of God within them, they'll reject this pagan idea of the Trinity. Thank you for watching.